Okay, so now we will be going through the functions of the blood. Uh, in this area, right, you actually understand the, how the plasma actually transport various substances and how red blood cells actually carry out its function with respect to the transportation of oxygen. Well, white blood cells in combating uh, your infections like a bacteria and of course how blood clotting actually occurs. So uh, for transport functions of blood, right, blood together as a whole right, acts as a transport medium. Transport medium meaning that it actually helps to act like a car to carry different substances around your whole body. Uh, based on the last few videos, right, we actually talk about how um, the importance of having a transport system in your body to allow all your nutrients that has been absorbed by the body to actually allow it to also have other parts of your body to be able to absorb all these nutrients. Uh. Okay, so uh, some of these uh, substances are definitely your digested food substances. Now, excretory products, right, tends to be the uh, meta it can be the metabolic waste products that will be required to be removed from your body. You have your hormones, you have your heat, mainly to keep your body warm, but at the same time to also um, lose some form of level of heat. We will talk more about it in the next few chapters. And of course, the transport of oxygen, where oxygen is mainly used for aerobic respiration by your body. Okay. So how is um, oxygen being transported to all parts of your body? Mainly by the red blood cell. So in your blood components, right, the main one that actually helps to do this is the red blood cell. And what happens is that the red blood cell contains a very, very special compound, which is the hemoglobin. And, as, and this hemoglobin actually helps to com or to combine with oxygen to in the form of oxyhemoglobin. Together, this can then be transported by a red blood cell to all parts of the body. So first of all, the blood will pass through the lungs and oxygen helps to diffuse through the air sacs in the lungs into the blood. Now, do take note that oxygen right, is actually not a, a water molecule, so it's not osmosis. Instead, it's actually diffusion. And along your alveoli, they, you have actually this thin film of moisture uh, which you will cover more in the next chapter on respiration that helps to aid in this level of uh, diffusion. Then blood will then be transported, uh, blood will transport oxygen to all parts of the tissue in the body, mainly by your uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, not say pulmonary, sorry, uh, mainly by your arteries in the blood vessels. And um, at the tissue cells, right, oxygenated blood tends to release the oxygen to the rest of your body, to the cells. Okay, so this is one. Second thing, blood has another function which is to actually protect it. How does it undergo this protective uh, feature is number one, through blood clotting. Big, uh, why blood clotting? Blood clotting helps to act as a physical barrier to prevent external environment bacteria from entering into your body so that you will actually uh, attack your body. So blood clotting helps to at least set the boundary between the external environment and your internal body environment. This is mainly performed by the uh, platelets in your blood. Then you have phagocytosis and production of antibodies. These are the two mechanisms that actually helps to combat bacteria if it actually enters into your body um, and it is worked together by your white blood cell. Now there is two types of white blood cell. You have your phagocytes and your lymphocytes. So your phagocytes will be the one responsible for phagocytosis and your lymphocytes will be the one responsible for the production of antibodies which will then be used to actually combat the bacteria. So blood, the clotting process will immediately start when there is actually an exposure to air. And this will prevent, this will actually seal the wound to prevent any entry of bacteria and further loss of blood. So these are the two things that it, it actually aids uh, when it comes to blood clotting. Now, how is the whole uh, structure of or the flow flow uh, flow of uh, blood being uh, formation of the blood clot? First of all, having a damaged tissue either through a cut, um, and a, and the, and then the platelets will then actually release an enzyme called thrombokinase. How do you recognize it's an enzyme? You tend to see it's a A N A S E. So what this thrombokinase do is to actually convert inactive prothrombin to active thrombin. Now, prothrombin uh, pro is actually in an inactive form, meaning it's something like a sleeping mode. And therefore, when it's floating around your body, it doesn't actually carry out its function. 
only when it responds to thrombokinase, which is due to the result of exp- um, get it yourself getting hurt uh, or damage of tissues, then it will become in an active form where it will tell itself to start to work. And what this active thrombin does is it actually converts your soluble fibrinogen into insoluble uh, fibrin tract. Now, why must it be soluble to insoluble? Because your blood clot, the mesh, you do not want it to be something soluble whereby, let's say you go and wash your hands or wash the blood and the blood clot actually dissolve in water. You will not want that to happen. And being soluble um, in its inactive form, uh, it will be able to dis- um, move around your body and uh, move to the area where it's needed. And when the and converted to insoluble fibrin tracks like what we just uh, discussed, where together they will actually form a mesh to act as a physical outer covering. Okay, so in a nutshell, in a nutshell, these are the three main processes that actually occur for blood clotting, where damaged tissue and platelets helps to produce your enzyme thrombokinase. Thrombokinase will then activate prothrombin into the active form of thrombin together with your calcium ions and through your fibrinogen when you actually have the presence of thrombin it will then convert your insoluble it will then com- help to convert your soluble fibrinogen tracts into insoluble fibrin tracts and this will then form a mesh to trap blood cells in your body so now let's look at the second the second way in which our body is actually adapted to fight off the infection so just now we talk about blood clotting so this involves mainly the external environment with the internal environment so that's the first layer of defense the second layer of defense will be through phagocytosis whereby phagocytosis is the process of your white blood cells mainly your phagocytes to help to engulf and ingest the foreign particles example bacteria by the phagocytes now what's the difference between engulf and ingest it engulf means it helps to surround so in a sense let's say you have a cell so it tends to surround just maybe one particle then ingest is when this whole thing actually enters directly inside the body and then of the white blood cell so it is uh, involved both processes so phagocytes will actually first of all and swallow the foreign particles uh, such as bacteria please use the word engulf and not the word swallow and slowly the bacteria are then ingested and digested in the phagocytes now how do you recognize a phagocyte with as compared to a lymphocyte it's through this shape it actually has a locked nucleus for a phagocyte so that's one way to recognize it second uh, the second white type of white blood cell is your lymphocytes and what lymphocytes does is that antibodies are produced by your lymphocytes and these will then bind to the bacteria and cause their surface membrane to be ruptured so what happens is you can see that these antibodies are like uh, bullets uh, of a weapon which actually punctures the bacterial cell membrane and allow it to actually be uh, rupt- uh, destroyed in a sense so other than that the bacterial cells will also be able to clump together in the presence of antibodies and and this actually helps a lot because some of these will actually allow your phagocytes to come in to actually engulf and to capture all these bacteria much easier as compared to finding bits and pieces of them then toxins produced by your bacteria are also neutralized by these antibodies so one very common issue right when it comes to um, defending your body is organ transplant and tissue rejection so whenever you have a uh, organ or tissue transplant right this would then involve you putting a foreign body into your own personal body this might be due to maybe initially your bo- your original's body's kidney is failed has failed so you will need another donor to actually pass it to you and uh, put it so that i uh, put it in a body so that you can function properly but i uh, do recognize that even with all those tests this is still something foreign so what will happen your body may actually recognize it as a foreign entity and may actually produce antibodies to try to actually destroy the transplant so this is what usually this is one of the uh, issues when it comes to organ transplant where there's a possibility of tissue rejection where your immune system in the body starts to attack the healthy liver that is being or, or any organ that is donated to your body now there are ways to reduce the risk of 
tissue rejection which includes either a tissue match tissue max meaning match meaning you either come from something that's very similar to your body that the immune system recognize it as uh, it's not it's not really foreign or the other way is to use immunosuppressive drugs which actually tends to work by reducing your immune system now do take note that when you do that right by reducing the immune system in your body you are also putting yourself at risk because this means that your body has a lower chance of fighting other forms of infection or bacteria okay now we are talk about the circulatory system so in the circulatory system you will learn the different components of your circulatory system in human what are the vessels that transport it in your syllabus there's only three the arteries veins and capillaries and how does materials actually being transported between your capillaries and tissue fluids so the transport system in human is also known as the cardiac vascular uh, vascular system as it is mainly made up of your heart and blood vessels the cardio means heart the vascular means vessel blood vessel okay and this is and in general this whole thing is also known as circulatory system so in exam they tend to use this word circulatory system more often which really under which really meant how blood actually is transported around your body now the main components of your circulatory system is the three uh, types of uh, blood vessel and of course the heart the heart is why it's mainly the muscular pump that helps to enable the amount of push factor so that blood can actually be transported to all parts of your body the blood vessels that actually carries all this is your vein which transport blood into the heart the artery that carries blood away from the heart so one way to remember is veins has the INS so it's into the heart and artery because there's the word A so same thing like away so it carries away from the heart then next we have your venous and also your capillaries and your arterioles so the just imagine your arterioles as the smaller version of your arteries because your arteries can come in many different size so the arterioles is the smaller size your venules are basically uh, the, the, the smaller version of the veins and of course the capillary is mainly the link bridge between your arteries and the veins to allow that diffusion of nutrients to the art to your tissue fluid and your cells we will talk more on how the different blood vessels are adapted to carry out its, uh, these features so at the capillary bed the arterial blood helps to contain the glucose and um, oxygen and do remember that when we talk about blood containing oxygen we call it oxygenated blood now because of this they tend to be red in color so you tend to have a pinkish tint on your skin so uh, however in the veins you actually have higher concentration of co2 carbon dioxide and metabolic waste products such as urea okay and so and this would actually mean that you have a reduction in oxygen concentration so you are carrying deoxygenated blood now why is this so because along this region here all these nutrients would have already diffused towards the cells so all these useful substances has been moved to the cells therefore the veins would actually do, uh, contain lesser of such nutrients and the color of these is actually they tend to be bluish purple so uh, one example is in the event you actually you know you carry heavy work uh, heavy things or uh, there's limited blood flow you tend to feel quite cold on your hand okay the other one is you'll see it turns blue in color this is because the area there has limited supply of oxygen or that lesser oxygenated blood is uh, passed into those regions so there are three main types of blood vessels that you need to know in exam in generally in exam they may ask you to compare uh, on the these three as either an essay question so for artery they tend to carry blood away from the heart for the capillaries they allow the exchange of materials what materials your glucose your oxygen between blood and tissues and of course the vein carries blood towards the heart so the arteries right has these few main functions uh, in which it helps to transport oxygenated blood from the heart to other parts of the organs in the body however there is an exception to this okay the exception to this is mainly is actually 
your pulmonary artery this one we will talk more when we reach as to how blood is pumped around the body okay but do take note that pulmonary artery is the only artery that carries deoxygenated blood okay in the artery family and that they actually have very in the arteries they tend to have very thick muscular walls to help to support blood coming from the heart which is of higher pressure so you can see the thickness of the muscular walls okay and this would actually result in your lumen which is this particular region here to be smaller okay um, and this is and the reason is having a thicker muscular wall helps to be able to support blood from coming at a higher pressure and mus muscles tend to contract and relax to cause constriction and dilation of the artery respectively look so if you in comparison to your vein while it transport deoxygenated blood except the pulmonary vein okay this helps to transport blood into the heart um, but do take note that they actually have very thin walls which are less elastic so you see it's actually very thin and this will result in the lumen to be very very large so this will also help in a sense that more channels of blood are able to flow through generating lesser pressure as compared to maybe the artery and that having a thinner elastic wall helps to prevent or to lower uh, it is it's less able to take that amount of blood pressure in the vein well veins as compared to the others they actually have this very special thing which is called the valves and these veins have valves to actually help to prevent blood from flowing backwards so the, this, the direction of the flaps tends to move in the same direction as the arrowhead okay so do take note of that when when it when actually there's a backflow of blood the valves will actually shut itself so that no blood will actually flow backwards now some of us may see like oh the veins they have to transport uh, why is it so important to have these valves uh, reason being because veins right they tend to transport more blood from the legs up against gravity to the heart so having these valves along with your skeletal muscles contracting and relaxing helps to push blood upwards towards your heart as you do not want your body to have very limited supply of blood at the, to at the top of your body yeah. okay. then of course you have your capillaries which are your endothelium that consists of single layers of flattened cells these walls they tend to be partially permeable allowing osmosis and diffusion to occur um, another thing is that this allows all your new uh, good nutrients to also be passed through the towards the tissue fluid and to be subsequently absorbed by your cells so the capillary how does it actually cope with the amount of pressure is that there's actually a very wide capillary network that helps to increase the surface area and total cross-sectional area to help to improve efficiency exchange of substances between blood and cells and at the same time helps to diffuse some of the pressure that you actually get from the artery okay so generally this is how the whole structure how substances are exchanged between capillary and tissue where they are in two different environments where you have your blood capillaries to act as the vessel to actually carry all your blood cells and other items and nutrients and only the nutrients because it is partially permeable only the nutrients like your oxygen and your glucose or food substances are able to diffuse downwards to the cell via the tissue fluid and when the cells actually uses all these uh, uh, items they would actually generate metabolic waste such metabolic waste products can then be channeled back to the blood for it to be transported to other areas of the body okay. so tissue fluid what is it is generally a colorless fluid found in a tiny space between cells and useful substances such as your oxygen and glucose they tend to move from the blood to in the capillary to your tissue fluid and then to the cells by diffusion waste material it will be ge released generally from the cells so it will be diffused fr from the cells to the tissue fluid and to the tissue fluid through the capillary walls into the blood the blood will then transport will carry all these metabolic waste to the respective excretory, uh, ex excretory organs for removal
So uh, we will end here for now. Um, do review the video and to check for your understanding.